as expected, Gladiator 2 is a truly awful movie and an outright atrocity from the historical perspective. The screenwriting is far worse than in the recent That Was About To Die TV series, and that TV series had pretty lousy screenwriting. But it looks like a work of professionals in comparison to Ridley Scott's movie. Naturally, in the weeks leading up to the release, we started to hear noises from the PR department and some pocket critics who attended early screenings, uh, making claims uh, that this Gladiator 2 is, in fact, one of the best movies of the year and should receive numerous uh, Academy Awards, including Best Picture. As always in these matters, uh, this is all just a PR campaign. Gladiator 2 is a weak, boring and hilariously stupid movie. Just like its predecessor, it is not really a historical movie and it shouldn't be marketed as one. For screenwriters of both movies, Ancient Rome is a fantasy backdrop uh, set on a different planet. I made a 40-minute video about Gladiator back in the day, uh, when I was shooting videos uh, with a kettle instead of a camera. A link in the description. And I made a number of other film analysis videos as well. So uh, I will be repeating myself again, but it has to be done. So first of all, I don't have a problem if you're making up stuff to construct a good story. I'm a grown up and I know the difference between a documentary and fiction. I have a problem when your story has all the features of a hostile military or religious propaganda, even if you don't really notice that. I don't care about minor alterations or simplifications of the historical events for the convenience of the plot, but I do have a problem when you're making a World War II movie and say that the war started in 1925 uh, when the King of Poland invaded Spain. Both Gladiator and Gladiator 2 are guilty of doing that. That's the level of nonsense we're dealing with here. Which, first of all, relegates both of those movies uh, to a category of brain-dead fun. And uh, that's not the category the filmmakers see themselves in. They have certain ambitions, they expect Oscars. They don't see themselves in the company of movies like Death Stalker. And second, all of this is not as innocent as people usually think. Once again, we're dealing with Roman culture through the eyes of a barbarian who doesn't know how stuff works. But he's absolutely sure that Romans are evil imbeciles simply because they are Romans. And sometimes uh, tries to lecture us. I've divided this video into a number of segments for everybody's convenience. And naturally, we'll start the analysis with gladiatorial combat, because the movie is literally called Gladiator. Part 2. Gladiatorial Combat This misunderstanding of gladiatorial combat is one of the major obstacles to understanding classical antiquity. Uh, children in school are told stories about this atrocious sport and while uh, they might find it kind of fascinating, they come away with the idea that the Romans were essentially savages, a primitive society who paid money to watch public executions. And movies like Gladiator help to promote this nonsense and obscure the truth about this civilization. This, again, is not as innocent and not as harmless as you might think. There is a reason why ancient Rome and its history and culture is important. And I am not saying this as a person who was sent off by parents to study classical antiquity, who's making a living from classical studies and therefore his perception is distorted by the field in which he is working. Uh, that's not me. I've been fascinated by history from a young age, but I came to the realization of why ancient Greece and ancient Rome is of prime importance, uh, why, uh, why is it the foundation of a civilization, only when I was around 30 years of age. And that's why I started to study it more methodically and systematically. I'm not the one who thinks this is super important because this is the subject that I study. I study it because it is super important. It is far more important than people are led to believe. Once again, 
Don't want to sound like a broken record, but since the majority of the viewers see me for the first time, gladiatorial combat, as it is depicted in popular culture, is not a thing. It is an erroneous concept that gained traction. Gladiatorial combat was more or less like professional wrestling today, with scripted combat. And even though real-life combaters indeed fought in the arena, it was mostly a political PR stunt and he used a wooden sword. Yes, you can take this idea of a cruel and violent sport and construct something entertaining and plausible. For a movie like The Running Man or Rollerball. Or The Blood of Heroes. But if you claim this kind of blood sport actually existed in ancient Rome, you're making a fool of yourself. And you're tolerated because this bizarre idea was popularized by essentially religious fanatics who knew nothing about professional sports, because the whole concept was rediscovered only in the 20th century. But this outdated concept spilled into mass culture, gained traction and became a trope. And because of sheer inertia, we frequently perceive this as something normal. It is not normal. If you try to persuade people that baseball is about beating the opposing team to a pulp with a baseball bat, and since it is very popular in the United States, it demonstrates that we're dealing with a country of savages, uh, then we have a problem here. Movies and books about gladiators are doing exactly that. They invent an outrageously erroneous concept and narrative, and then try to persuade everyone that Romans were horrible people. It's okay to think that your cultural ancestors were horrible people. If they actually were horrible people, you are not them. But when someone is trying to persuade you that your ancestors were monsters, while in fact they were good, very good people, then you have all the rights to be angry and all the reasons to suspect foul play. The Timeline Gladiator 2 is set 16 years after the first movie, which is hilarious. In theory, we could pinpoint the actual year in which the story takes place. But no, we can't, because the first Gladiator is an old history movie, which takes place in some parallel reality where Commodus is killed after just a year or two as sole emperor. Real-life Commodus was killed in the year 192. If you add 16 years to that, the reigning emperor would be Septimius Severus. If we are in an alternate timeline and uh, Commodus died in the year 182, then we have the year 198 and the emperor is, once again, Septimius Severus. Caracalla and Geta are his children and they received full power only after their father's death in 211. No explanation for anything is given, Septimius Severus is never mentioned, everything is treated as a fantasy universe and a pretty dumb one. I'd like to reiterate this bit with the Second World War started in 1925 when the King of Poland invaded Spain. That's the world of Gladiator 2, that's the historical logic of this movie. Macrinus. For some reason, Macrinus is called Macrinus in the film. He's theoretically based on Marcus Apelius Macrinus, a short-lived emperor who succeeded Caracal. The historical Macrinus was from North Africa, and he is referred to as a Moor in the primary sources, which means that he was, well, a North African. That's the distant ancestors of the people currently known as Berbers. Since Macrinus is played by Denzel Washington, a black American. That's uh, textbook blackwashing. North Africans aren't black. Uh, the filmmakers are just pushing their diversity agenda and pandering to the modern audiences that exist in their imagination. Or more accurately, pandering to the people in power who promote this agenda. And I say this as someone who kind of defended depicting Zeus as a as black when Troy, Fall of a City, Netflix TV series, was released. Uh, you can depict Achilles as black, but Zeus, why not? Uh, he can be even green or blue. It's irrelevant. Unless you're doing this to increase your social credit and promote racist policies. Now, there is another interpretation of what the screenwriters wanted to say, and you're not gonna like this interpretation. 
This interpretation is based on the assumption that the screenwriters, David Scarpa and story writer Peter Craig, are not idiots, and they are not. Uh, they can be unprofessional in their approach, they clearly have a very limited knowledge of uh, ancient Rome and don't want to spend at least a couple of days to research the basics, but they are not complete morons. So the character of Macrinus gradually reveals his intentions and his philosophy, which adds a certain depth to the character. He is a former slave, he has a dark skin pigmentation, he is anti-Stoicism, anti-Marcus Aurelius, uh, he is concerned only with power and believes that the strongest should take it. Essentially, life is a zero-sum game for him. Uh, if you have more, then I have less. I think they are alluding to the neo-Marxist concepts and to the BLM movement in particular in a slightly concealed way. You know, a bit like uh, Yorgos Lanthimos constructed his Poor Things as a movie that some critics may perceive as a feminist story. Well, in fact, it is a mockery of uh, modern pseudo-feminism and a few other isms uh, as well. Uh, come on, uh, the film literally tells you that you need to have uh, the brain of a two-year-old to be a socialist. Barbie also looked like a profound anti-feminist and even anti-women movie, uh, calling for a gender war. But apparently it wasn't in the design, it is just a reflection of the screenwriter's intellectual limitations uh, rather than deliberate intent. In this reading, Blackhurst McRinus in Gladiator 2 can be interpreted as some sort of critique of, uh, let's put it this way, the behavior of modern black American activists and their ideology. And McRinus in Gladiator 2, if you're paying attention, is not really moving to the desired result. The death of McRinus is the only logical conclusion of his actions. He could never succeed in the first place. This is stopped by a quote about slaves and freedom. Uh, which we hear more than once in Gladiator 2. This quote exists in different versions and usually goes like, a slave doesn't dream of freedom, but of his own slaves. Or uh, slaves dream not of freedom, but of becoming masters. That's actually the history of Liberia in a nutshell. So the quote is quite accurate. The screenwriters of Gladiator 2 attribute this phrase to Cicero. But it must be noted that he most probably didn't say that. Uh, this quote has been wrongly attributed to numerous historical figures. Now, the historical Macrinus, who is far more interesting than what we see in Gladiator 2. Naturally, he wasn't a master of gladiators and uh, he wasn't a former slave. Yes, he was a Praetorian prefect and the fictional Denzel Macrinus actually becomes one late in the movie. He conspired to kill Caracalla under very colorful circumstances. Uh, the legend says that Caracalla was assassinated while taking a piece. And uh, you know, then he ruled for one year and made his son the Dominion a co-emperor. And then Caracalla's family, the Emerson dynasty or clan, assembled troops, won a brief civil war and installed Marcus Aurelius as a new emperor. No, seriously, Elagabal was officially ruled as Marcus Aurelius Antoninus, just like Caracalla. Now, uh, you can create an interesting story around that, but this story would probably become very political, because we are talking about the Severan dynasty and about the aftermath of the civil war, which was won by Septimius Severus, who was a Carthaginian. And Septimius Severus was the worst emperor of Rome if you measure the consequences of his reign. Uh, Severus also brought quite a lot of people from North Africa with him. Brought people who shouldn't have been there in the first place, like Macrinus. And essentially, that's how the crisis of the third century became possible. And now it's time for some shameless self-promotion. I have this beautiful Oedipus slash Antigone visual novel game I made. It is available on Steam, link in the description. It is an adaptation of the Theban cycle of Sophocles. If you're not interested in ancient Greek tragedy, I have another visual novel on the way. It is an old history sci-fi horror called Space is Red. I will post the link as soon as the Steam page goes live. Thank you, let's continue.
Caracalla and Geta. The characters of Caracalla and Geta are supposedly based on the eponymous emperors, but in reality they share almost nothing with their real-life counterparts beyond their names and the fact that they were brothers. Not twins, uh, just brothers. That's where their resemblance ends. Actually, in the case of Caracalla, they didn't even borrow his name, they borrowed his nickname. Uh, Caracalla is not a name and screenwriters apparently don't know that. You cannot address him as Caracalla. You'll be kicked out of the room immediately and uh, it will have consequences for your career. Just like you couldn't address Emperor Gaius with his childhood nickname Caligula. It is just wildly inappropriate and openly disrespectful. You cannot show up to a meeting with President Biden and start calling him Amtrak Joe or Brandon. In Gladiator 2, Caracalla is a proper name. He's announced as Emperor Caracalla. Well, in fact, Caracalla was a hooded tunic which uh, this emperor really liked to wear. His actual name was, uh, well, uh, that's complicated. Uh, he reigned under the name Marcus Aurelius Antoninus because his father, Septimius Severus, retroactively adopted him into the Antonine dynasty. It is hard to explain this, and people generally pay this fact uh, less attention uh, than it deserves. It's a bit like Donald Trump uh, be uh, became president, uh, renamed himself Ronald Reagan, and declared himself the adopted son of the original Ronald Reagan. Uh, you would call this madness. Uh, how is this even possible? It was possible because a Carthaginian became the emperor as a result of the civil war and established a military dictatorship. And once again, this is something that the screenwriters ignore completely. Adding to the absurdity, characters in Gladiator 2 frequently reference Marcus Aurelius and even have the protagonist uh, who incorporates Aurelius into his own name. Yet no one acknowledges that one of the current emperors is literally named Marcus Aurelius. Caracalla was officially Marcus Aurelius. Naturally, if you want to be more or less authentic, Caracalla and Geta should be played by Arabs or by Jewish actors. But suddenly it becomes political and you might get all kinds of criticism for negative depictions of modern ethnic groups. So the filmmakers just go like, let's pretend they were proper Romans. Let's not pretend they were not. Anyway, Caracalla and Geta could provide a very good material for a movie adaptation. Everything's dramatic and you can easily extract several juice effects and construct a Shakespearean tragedy uh, which can be successfully performed at a country fair or in a pub. I mean, Caracalla kills Geta basically in the arms of their mother, everyone's crying, then he sacks Alexandria and the ghost of Septimius Severus appears and tells uh, to sacrifice 1,000 virgins on the tomb of Hannibal, but instead Caracalla sleeps with his cousin and they produce Lagabils. Uh, that's uh, not exactly how it happened, but you can extract a couple of facts and a couple of anecdotes and make Titus Andronicus out of this. Or you can make a serious political movie about the consequences of the reign of a Carthaginian emperor. But no, only the names were borrowed, uh, plus the fact that uh, Caracalla kind of kills Geta. But in Gladiator 2, he is actively assisted by Macrinus, or Macrinus, one of them. So that is why I don't really give an overview of Caracalla's reign. Well, I just did, actually. We basically can't compare the historical Caracalla with Caracalla from Gladiator 2 because uh, they share a nickname and that's it. Also, I was very disappointed when the screenwriters failed to address the question of citizenship, given the current political climate. I mean, even back in the days of the fall of the Roman Empire, we've heard interesting ideas about how Rome should have given citizenship to everyone. And in case you don't know, the first gladiator is more or less an unofficial remake of the fall of the Roman Empire. 
And Caracalla was the person who actually gave Roman citizenship to every free man in the empire. That's one of his most famous accomplishments. Uh, this and the fact that he murdered his own brother. Crazy emperors. Crazy emperors, kings and rulers in general is a weird trope, which is used a lot in mass culture and overused in Gladiator 2. And in the first Gladiator as well, but less prominently. Both Caracalla and Gera are visibly insane. Caracalla even has a medical diagnosis. Uh, Gera strongly hints that his brother has syphilis. In case you don't know, Syphilis is not about your nose falling off. It is about permanent brain damage. A person with neurosyphilis becomes intellectually disabled. These days, the disease, the disease in its early stages is cured literally with one shot of antibiotics. But back in the ancient world, well, I don't know. Uh, there are reports uh, that a few centuries ago, people actually knew a secret treatment for syphilis and some people used it. They drank crushed glass, uh, which caused small stomach lacerations, raising body temperature enough to kill the bacteria. But I digress. The screenwriters, like uh, countless others uh, before them, cling to the trope that everyone blindly follows the orders of a deranged monarch simply because, well, he's, uh, he's the monarch, uh, what can you do? Technically, the Roman Empire wasn't even a monarchy, but we're not discussing this right now. We're discussing a weird trope that shouldn't even exist. It is used a lot in political propaganda. It is mostly a lazy explanation of something or direct disinformation. I obviously have a video about this as well. So when you hear that a leader of, I don't know, North Korea is crazy and he's doing crazy things because of that, uh, that's just a propaganda cliché. That's character assassination, and nobody bothers to give you the actual explanation, which is most of the time rather complex. Same thing with historical and ancient historical material. In reality, nobody follows the orders of a clinically insane person. They lose all their power, they get isolated or killed. That's how the governments work. For genuinely crazy kings, please Google George III the king of Great Britain. If we're talking about ancient Rome, there was one particular emperor who most probably, although we cannot be 100% sure, was actually clinically insane. That's Gaius Caligula, who is obviously the main inspiration for the screenwriters. Caligula was doing okay until he had something that ancient historians call brain fever. So there is a theory that it was actually meningitis. His mental health began to deteriorate, and over time his behavior became increasingly erratic. Uh, you should uh, obviously ignore all these lurid anecdotes about how licentious he became or that he slept with his own sisters. He obviously did nothing like that. But it seems he began torturing senators and he was present at the procedures. As a result, he was killed by his own family, and his uncle took his place as the new emperor. Monkey Consul That's yet another ridiculous trope, and I obviously have a video on the subject as well, link in the description, yada yada yada. So Caracalla appoints his pet monkey as a consul, uh, which is an obvious reference to this story about Gaius Caligula and his horse. But Caligula never appointed his horse a consul, because there was no legal framework for anything like that. And there was no legal framework to appoint a monkey, just as no country today has laws allowing animals to hold official government positions. The anecdote about Caligula and his horse exists for two reasons. To discredit Rome and present it as a civilization of savages and to give people false ideas about how power works. Authoritarian leaders cannot appoint animals to official positions, no matter how authoritarian they are. 
Absolute monarchs cannot do this either, and neither Gaius Caligula nor Terracala were absolute monarchs, or even, you know, monarchs. Uh, one can make a case that Caligula wasn't even that uh, authoritarian, or Terracala for that matter. Here's how reality works. An authoritarian leader says that he or she wants to appoint a dog, horse, monkey, cat or goose to a position of, say, prime minister. The administration responds that there is no law for that. The leader says, I am the law, and tries to issue an official decree. Uh, people figure out he is insane, and one way or another, the leader gets removed from the office because his mental health doesn't allow him to make any decisions, and he puts all the inner circle and all the power players at risk. See the crazy emperor trope we just discussed. Lucius Verus. Let's imagine that Lucius Verus the Younger actually survived is an okay idea. I mean, it is a work of fiction, why not? I understand the difference between fiction and a documentary. And as I've said many times before, the problem with movies like Gladiator is not a problem of you cannot introduce fictional elements into a historical movie. You can and you should. The problem is of a different kind, as I've said before. The historical Lucius Verus was obviously dead, his mother was dead, everyone was dead, the end. In the movie, Lucius Verus ends up in Africa and gets enslaved as a result of hostilities, which is more or less realistic, unlike the first Gladiator, where a random gang catches a Roman general and then sells him into slavery without facing serious repercussions. And gradually we learn that Lucius Verus the Younger isn't actually the son of Emperor Lucius Verus. His real father was Maximus from the first film. At some point he starts referring to himself as Lucius Verus Aurelius. He is hailed as the Prince of Rome, although he is not Lucius Verus Aurelius and he is not a prince of anything. It is extra funny because the word prince is derived from the Roman word princeps. Then we hear how Lucius quotes more than once stuff like when we exist, death is not, and when death exists, we are not, or some permutation of the phrase. It is a quote from Epicurus. Uh, Lucius Verus is supposedly the heir to Marcus Aurelius. Marcus Aurelius was a Stoic. His meditations are mentioned in the movie for no reason. The biggest philosophical opponents of Stoics were Epicureans. Why do you use a quote from Epicurus? Is this some kind of joke, an Easter egg? New media and geography. Gladiator 2, like its predecessor, exists in the world with broken geography. The movie starts in the province of Africa Nova, New Africa, which didn't exist during the reign of Caracalla. In fact, it existed for only a few years, more than 200 years before Caracalla was even born. Then we witness the attack of the Roman army on some city with gigantic walls. And Romans actually successfully take the city from the sea in a completely absurd battle sequence, which the filmmakers perceive as jaw-dropping and everybody else perceives as completely nonsensical. Later, this city is referred to as, and I quote, the city of New Media. And I have no idea what they mean because Numidia was a region, it wasn't a city. It is also a complete mystery to me why the Roman army is attacking their own province. Obviously, the screenwriters add traditional stuff like Romans leave only destruction and uh, show how diverse inhabitants of the African city try to save their non-existing independence from the evil imperialist colonizers. The phrase like Romans leave only destruction and uh, that they don't have a land of their own, instantly mark Gladiator II as a vile and completely false propaganda piece. The inhabitants of the city of Numidia are depicted as very noble, not very white, and they have female warriors because female warriors are a thing. Well, at least they made the wife of the protagonist an archer. It is at least believable to some extent. The screenwriters fail to mention that the territories which previously belonged 
to Carthage were largely inhabited by the people of Carthaginian culture, the culture that sacrificed their firstborn children to the god Baal Hamon. Then we have a flashback about the childhood of Lucius, uh, when he is suddenly in some village near the pyramids, and pyramids are in Egypt. And the village is under attack from evil Romans, who apparently were systematically attacking their own provinces. It's hard to make any sense out of this, because uh, there is no sense, except the desire to portray Romans as evil people who oppress good people in relatively exotic locations. Roman names. Gladiator had a serious problem with Roman names, and Gladiator II is trying to rival its predecessor. Senator Trax is probably the most insane of the names in this movie. Uh, they probably derive the name from the Emperor Maximinus Trax. Uh, Trax means Thracian. And this impossible Maximinus was an actual Thracian. Then we have the character of uh, Darius Sextus. Once again, Darius. Then, obviously, as I've said earlier, the screenwriters seriously think that Caracalla is a name. Then we have a general named uh, Eustace Acacius, or Marcus Eustace Acacius, uh, which is kind of funny. And don't forget Lucius Verus Aurelius, uh, which is one hell of a combination. It is a theoretically possible combination, but a quite unlikely one. Officially, his father, the emperor, was known as Lucius Aurelius Verus. It is also worth noting that the actors routinely mispronounce Roman names, including Marcus Aurelius. People do that. I do that. Uh, my excuse is that I am speaking a second language. What is their excuse? Obviously, they also mispronounce Latin words. Miscellaneous stuff. Now, let's briefly go over a wide range of small, hilarious inaccuracies and downright absurdities sprinkled throughout the movie. Lucius meets Ravi, an Indian doctor, who has a British wife, who says, we are Romans now. My prediction for the director's cut of Gladiator 2 is that it will include a scene with a Jewish lawyer. When the wife of Lucius dies, we see two ferrymen, basically two Charons. Uh, what is this? Or is it supposed to represent some unknown religion, like the Carthaginian cult? They have naval battle in the Colosseum, which is okay, stuff like that was actually performed. But everything else about it is wrong, including the, the sharks in the water. Those about to die used crocodiles, by the way. But the funniest part, this is supposedly a reenactment of the Battle of Salamis. And uh, they have Persian ships and Spartan ships. We can clearly see the lambda on their shields. Yes, Spartans did contribute a number of ships to the battle, but literally a half of the Greek fleet was made up of Athenian vessels. It is estimated that Athens had 180 ships, while Sparta had 16. Why do you use Spartan shields in this reenactment? An Easter egg? An in-joke? Battle with mutant monkeys. No, I'm not gonna comment on that. Crucifixions. Crucifixions are mentioned, but luckily we don't see any completely ahistorical crosses. But Macrinus also says something like crucifixions are for thieves and Christians, which is uh, where do you find Christians in the second century? I mean, yeah, according to the church historians, they were everywhere, but come on, seriously. White marble. It's everywhere. Plain white statues, etc. The statues are supposed to be painted, everything is supposed to be painted. Also, you can play a game when we have a proper home release or a digital copy of the movie. So, theoretically, you can play a game of find a weird or anachronistic statue. I'm sure there's gonna be some nice results. Clothing. Not gonna comment too much on that, and I'm not a huge specialist on the subject in the first place. Some clothing looks really strange, and that somehow even includes Roman senators. I thought you cannot go wrong with senators, but apparently you can. 
the screenwriters inject some ancient quotes and concepts to sound smart, and they fail. So I have to mention this strange phrase, Greeks called it timos, uh, which I cannot really understand. Uh, what do they mean? Uh, the concept of uh, time, uh, which uh, can be very loosely translated as honor, a concept relevant to the works of Homer. What does it have to do with anything? Or are they uh, talking about uh, Thimos? Uh, what is this? Insane emperors want to invade Persia and India. I understand that we're talking about crazy emperors, but that's a bit too much and the phrase appeared in the script because the screenwriters wanted to demonstrate that Romans were mongering imperialists, which is not entirely true. Sometimes it is even completely untrue. And nobody really had plans to invade India. And while Trajan conquered a significant part of Persia, his successor Hadrian actually gave most of it back because Rome couldn't control and administer it properly. The empire was overstretching a bit too much. Rome didn't want to conquer everything and everyone. They were usually quite rational about their wars. Conclusion. Okay, let's wrap this all up. Gladiator 2 is not only a bad alternate history movie that for some reason is marketed as a historical film. It is also essentially a propaganda piece which attempts to depict ancient Rome as a society of degenerates. Uh, that's uh, what these kinds of movies usually do, and I have a video about 15 best movies set in Rome which illustrates this idea vividly. Between ridiculous fights with monkeys and battle rhinos in the Colosseum, Gladiator 2 starts moralizing, starts saying profoundly stupid things about the dream that was Rome, tells us how Rome brings destruction and, I quote, this city infects everything it touches. At the beginning of this video, I said that once again, we're dealing with Roman culture through the eyes of a barbarian. And I have all the reasons to say that. And all the reasons to be repulsed by the filmmakers who spread grotesque lies about the foundations of our civilization. Don't forget to like and subscribe, follow me on Twitter for no reason, and check out the games I'm releasing on Steam. Thank you for watching and see you soon.